Good afternoon. I am Kelly Brown Douglas, Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary here in New York City. Thank you for joining us for another in our series of Just Conversations, where we engage issues of racialized inequities intrinsic to our nation and our collective responsibility to create a more just future. This fall, our Just Conversations are focusing on the issues raised by the New York Times essays known as the 1619 Project. This afternoon, we are paying particular attention to the issue of environmental racism raised in various ways in the 1619 essays. I am so honored and most privileged to have joined me today in our conversation, one who has been called a modern day David, Mr. Justin Pearson, to help us to understand on the ground realities of environmental racism and what we can do about it. Justin Pearson is a child of Memphis, Tennessee with a long time commitment to the pursuit of justice for the black community in Memphis in particular and all persons in general, including a fight for textbooks for him and his high school classmates. It was this justice commitment which compelled him along with two black women to co-found the Memphis community against the pipeline a gas, grassroots black community led environmental justice organization seeking to end the racism and injustices in Memphis with the stopping of the Behelia connection pipeline. Justin would become the most visible if not most vulnerable vocal leader of the movement against this pipeline. There is so much more that I could say about this truly remarkable advocate for justice, Justin Pearson but I want you to discover the power of his voice and the prophetic leadership that is his through hearing him. And so let me welcome to the conversation and thank Justin Pearson for joining me today. Welcome and thank you, Justin. Oh my goodness. Thank you uh, for this opportunity and that uh, spirited and much too kind introduction. Uh, I am grateful to be of service. Uh, and grateful to have the opportunity to be here with you uh, at this moment in American history, at this moment in our movements for justice. Uh, and uh, we all should be feeling the fierce urgency of now, as Dr. King called it, uh, in that pursuit. And I'm glad to just be one of the servants uh, uh, in that and following the leadership and the guidance and the hard work of folks like you uh, who've uh, paved ways and continue to do so uh, for our community and for our country. Well, you are very gracious and you aren't just one of the servants, you are a servant leader and uh, leading the way and get, paving the way and providing hope uh, for many of us. Justin, I wanna jump right in, uh, in this discussion of uh, environmental racism, particularly uh, as it has impacted your community. As we talk about climate change and the environment, we often hear about environmental racism and the historical legacy of environmental racism was touched on, as I said, in the 1619 Project. But we rarely what we rarely focus on is the fact that it's real. It's not theoretical, <laughs> it's not academic, it's not abstract, but it happens in real communities impacting the lives and the bodies of real people. The fight against the Behelia pipeline is a classic case study of this. And indeed it is a David versus Goliath story as you and the black citizens of Memphis took on a big Texas oil company. And guess what? You won. So can you tell us about this story of black Memphis and the pipeline? Of course, oh, we won. Uh, the, and I, I tell folks, you know, I love the David and Goliath comparison uh, for our community versus these oil giants, because see, we, 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 we know how the story ends. Uh, and uh, they may not remember how that ends, but, but we remember how the story ends. And so even in the most difficult times, it gives us some hope and courage uh, to press on. But to your point, uh, the Bahaley Connection Pipeline, which was a project proposed by Valero Energy Corporation and Plains All-America, Plains All-American was one of the most environmentally unjust and environmentally racist projects that you could imagine. Um, in the words, not only in the actions that they were proposing, Dean Douglas, they called the community the path of least resistance. 
um, one of their own staff people said that uh, verbatim to a community, a former a community in Memphis known as Boxtown, which was an, a freedman's community, it is a freedman's community founded by formerly enslaved African-Americans, and they called it the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, and why? Because it'd been socially, politically, and economically deprived. It's a community that was redlined, right, mm -hmm. uh, into this space. And so when they decided where they were going to build it in Memphis, it was, we're going to go through that community because they won't be able to fight back. They won't be able to resist, uh, but they don't know the spirit of the people in Westwood and the spirit of the people in Boxtown, the spirit of the people in Memphis who are, understand uh, people power. Uh, and so what we came up against was a, two corporations who thought uh, that because it was a black community, it was a lower wealth community, it was going to be easily preyed upon. Uh, but that whisper uh, against it that started in Boxtown really became a clarion call for justice across our city, across racial lines, and across our country to recognize the everyday impacts of what is happening in Black communities. Right. We are being exploited. We are being mistreated and misused this very day. And so if you are Black, African American, if you are lower wealth, if you are Indigenous or a person of color, you are very likely to be preyed on by these corporations. And we know that to be true. And so what are we going to do about it is, is, is the question that uh, we decided to answer as a community uh, and we decided to fight. And so, uh, as you <laughs> alluded to, we were successful in that fight. Well, so you say that as if it was sort of just something that came natural. We decided to fight. We decided to do something about it. But you were facing this behemoth of a company, a Fortune 500 uh, uh, corporation. And we know that there is a long legacy, as you've alluded mm -hmm. to, to these kind of things happening and whether they're putting uh, water sewage plants in, right. in Black communities. I remember growing up and always smelling that. Uh, uh, right. And here's the thing, Justin, most people figure, well, there's nothing that we can do about it. You can't fight corporate or institutional Goliaths. What in the world made you think that it was possible to fight this Goliath? And what you learn in this regard? Look, it, it was necessary to fight. I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say this. We, in my opinion, are in a different point in American history than we have been in recent memory. After the lynching of George Floyd, mm -hmm. uh, the realities uh, of the Black experience uh, in a, a lot of different ways became apparent, right? You got to forgive me here. You got to forgive me here. Yeah, Justin <laughs> is in his former high school. They've loaned him a room. That's <laughs> God bless him. Uh, we are in a different moment after that lynching and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, that we are starting to think about the intersections that are impacting black life in a way that we had not before. And this too is true for me. And I believe it is true for our community in Memphis. And so we are dealing with the present moment and conditions that we are in, as well as a history in Memphis of movement making. Ida B. Wells as a Memphian led the movement uh, against lynching. Right, the environmental justice movement uh, was started by 1,300 black sanitation workers, uh, and uh, with the leadership of a black woman, obviously Cornelia Crenshaw, in the 1960s, intersecting environmental justice and civil rights. And so, it's really a part of who we are. And the community that they call the path of least resistance was one that our ancestors built with their bare hands and and, and with the wood that came off of a train. Uh, cars. That's why it's called Boxtown, right? And so you, you, you infuse our spirit and you infuse our history. And it was, we don't uh, have any other choice but to fight. Uh, it isn't always thinking about, you know, the end of like, are we going to win or what are we up against? It's that I, I, I can't guarantee anything, but what we do have is a history of people who have fought and we have a God who is big enough uh, to help us to win. Right. And I think those two things really did help us to realize, look, it, they might have more money. Right. They might have 20 executives, I think it was, working on this issue every day. Uh, but we've got God power and we've got people power. Uh, and, and that's going to help us uh, in this struggle. 
and the consciousness raising raising that is happening uh, as it relates to the toxins. You mentioned the wastewater treatment plants that are in black communities, right? The, the, the uh, landfills that are in black communities, the consciousness about, wait, this isn't, this isn't accidental and this isn't coincidental either. Uh, And getting our community who has long felt the brunt of this to realize these words matter. Environmental racism is what has happened to us. And you said this beautifully earlier to our bodies, right? To our lungs during a global pandemic, right? This is what's happening to us. And so we must resist uh, because we do not want to continue to live in, in, in a way where we are being exploited like this. My goodness, the power of all that you just said there and a couple of things I wanna pick up on, but this, I like this, you know, we have a God <laughs> that is bigger, right? Than, uh, than a corporation and those people who gave birth to Boxtown gave birth to Boxtown because they indeed believed uh, in in this God and and didn't do it in circumstances in which black life was held as sacred, uh, even less sacred than it's held as today. And and the faith, right? That uh, that faith in that God, well, that's that's the David that that you're talking about. Uh, So, so, I love that we are part of a legacy of people who always knew that even if they didn't experience for themselves the reality of the justice of God, that the justice of God would be made real. And so so they fought for that for us and you've continued that legacy. And it reminds me that change trickles up or, or, or radiates up, even if unjust power like these Goliaths uh, radiate or trickle down. But here's the other thing you said, Justin, that I want to make sure people heard. You clearly have connected these realities of redlining, of racism, of classism with the environmental racism. They come together to create environmental racism. And in, in effect, you talked about what happened there as sort of an environmental lynching of 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 black bodies lynching takes many different forms and we've seen that uh in a place like memphis uh in boxtown which is only an example of the many places that it has happened and taken place in saying that what you recognize is stopping the pipeline is not enough right that you know, there will be new manifestations. And in fact, in Southwest Memphis, the Tennessee Valley Authority after that fight said that they wanted to begin to store coal ash there, which is toxic. And so now you've moved your fight to a different level with those people. Can you talk about that? I think you're waiting now for laws and policies to be passed to prevent it. That's exactly right. Um, The fight against the pipeline revealed what was already happening. See, environmental racism has already been lynching us, yes. right? And, 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 it, and it's a slow lynching, as I call it. When you, when you pump uh, toxins into the air of Black communities and Black children have asthma and their parents spend more time in hospitals having to care for their young child who can hardly breathe, right? The, the, these are slow lynchings when you are forced to deal with wastewater treatment plants and steel mills in your community and that they cause uh, uh, many different forms of cancer in your environment, right? These things that Black people and lower wealth people uh, are dealing with uh, are choices being made by policymakers to zone certain areas as industrial. Right. These choices are being made by folks to make sure property values are lower uh, in certain communities so that you have lower wealth people uh, who have historically had less political influence and economic influence live in certain communities. Right. And you remove the proximity of people in power from those who have been historically disempowered. And when those voices of disempowered people wake up, when those voices of disempowered people are starting to be heard by those who have wealth, by those who have influence, by those who have been privileged in our society, we can change the way that we operate to move those who've been excluded and those who've been pushed to the margins to the center of our decision-making. 
And when we think about the policies that are necessary for us to get there, uh, we know in Memphis, particularly, we need policies regulating crude oil pipelines. In particular, right, this was just a fight. Uh, we, we don't need to have this type of infrastructure in our communities without our permission. Uh, and in Memphis being unique in that, we sit atop what's known as the Memphis Sand Aquifer. It's, yes. it's the size of Lake Michigan underneath our feet. Uh, our water that we drink today was rainwater 2,000 years ago. It's some of the purest, cleanest water in the world. And we have corporations for their own greed looking to build atop that yeah. through a predominantly Black community that they thought was powerless. And so we know, uh, and it's always we, we know that without just laws, there can be no justice. Yeah. Laws existing in and of themselves don't mean they're just. And so intentionality matters here. And so we have this upcoming Tuesday, uh, three pieces of legislation before the city council. One passed last week at the county commission that says crude oil pipelines can't be near our homes, our schools, our religious institutions, and our parks. Uh, we need to make sure that we protect this aquifer. So if you want to build something here that's going to hurt our water supply for us or for future generations, long after we are in the clouds and the stars, if you want to do something to hurt that, then you got to come uh, before the Memphis City Council to make sure that you get the necessary approvals, right? It's just creating some processes and approvals. And then it's, look, we get our water from the ground, all those areas where that comes up, that needs to be super protected as well. And so if we, if we don't protect it, we're going to be forced to have Black folk, poor folk in particular, have to refight for their very existence two years from now, three years from now. Right. And that burden is unfair and unjust. No, I like it's not just about the protests. It's not just about the present. It's about the policies and it's about the future. And it's about a legacy of the past, which you have just spoken, uh, referred to as well, that we have a long environmental racism isn't new in this, as you call it, this slow lynching of black bodies. And so what we have seen is the, what has now been called the comorbidities, uh, where black people are more susceptible to uh, life uh, negating uh, health issues. You said, and I've heard you say in other interviews that your grandmothers died of cancer that was probably environmentally induced. And in fact, studies have shown a higher rate of cancer in this box town, Southwest Memphis uh, area. So Justin, here's my question. We know the things that we need to do to ensure a life nurturing future for uh, future generations of disproportionately black poor people uh, and, and, and lower wealth people. But how do we begin to respond to the impact of the past upon uh, the present generation? In this regard, what does reparations look like in relationship to environmental racism? Yes. Um, uh, in Southwest Memphis, you got four times the national uh, average for cancer. Uh, both my grandmothers died in their 60s, right? Uh, uh, uncles and relatives dying in this community, Southwest Memphis in particular, decades before uh, white neighbors, right? Um, I, I say these things have to happen. We have to reflect. We have to say, how is it possible that in certain communities there in, in Southwest Memphis in particular, there's 17 toxic release inventory facilities uh, sending toxins into the air onto Boxtown and onto Westwood. How, how, did, how did we get here where the water that folks used to be able to boat in and used to be able to fish in is so contaminated now that it's illegal to fish in those places? Right? How do we get to a point where uh, uh, black children uh, compared to white children die 10 times more from asthma related causes? Or as you know, these statistics, black women die, uh, uh, mortality rate is three times higher than black than white women. We have to ask ourselves, what is happening in the environment uh, that is impacting the very lives of people? So we need to reflect and then we need to repent. And I think 
the actions that we do in the present moment uh, very immediately, such as policy change and advocacy and protesting, these are acts and a form of repentance for neglect of our communities that have been redlined, for neglect of our communities that have been uh, uh, pushed and forced into the margins. They didn't choose to be there. And then there needs to be reparations. We need to repair. So we have to reflect and recognize the history of where we got. We have to repent and get to doing some work in the immediate term. And then we need to repair, which requires both of those things sort of in tandem. Uh, environmental reparations, it looks like the closing of these oil uh, and, and these gas plants in communities, right? It, it looks like a real transition uh, from fossil fuels. Uh, it looks like uh, uh, real uh, laws being not only passed, but enforced that if pollution is happening, caps it, right? Uh, environmental reparations is financial. I, I, some folks don't want to talk about money. Um, you have poor folk who are paying for funerals of folks that they really can't right. afford. That's right. right. You see what I'm saying? Like these are, these are oh. the costs. And, 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 it, and it's about, isn't it, is it not as well, Justin, health insurance, making sure that everybody has access to health insurance because environmental racism has indeed meant that just as you said, Black children, Black families are suffering from health issues that are related to things in the environment that they've had no control over. And, and so you get this cycle, right? That they're suffering from these health concerns. They don't have, have health insurance. They, they get deeper into poverty of one can imagine for just trying to address the health concerns or they die. And, and so, you know, you are so right when it's, it is about, it is about money. It is about providing the resources for people to uh, care for themselves when choices have been made for their bodies uh, that are not life enhancing choices. And I like what you say yes. about this thing of repentance. You know, it's about turning around and doing something different. And you, uh, Justin, are leading the way toward this sort of metanoia, this repentance of turning around and doing something different. So I gotta, I've, I've got to ask you this. I've got th three more quick questions for you. But you know, you talked about your grandmothers dying at the uh, young age of sixty in their sixties. I'm glad you said that it was a young age in their sixties because I'm in my sixties. But uh, and so, uh, but that's the reality. You can't tell. Oh, well, aren't you kind? See, I knew I was going to like you, but, uh, but you are a young man and you came out of college ready to jump into this very complex, risky issue, moral issue of environmental racism. What? prepared you for this moment? And what can we do particularly in these institutions, our seminary institutions that are preparing students for ministry, what can we do to prepare or do better to prepare young folks for this long, hard battle of social and racial justice? I appreciate it. I appreciate the question. Um, uh, I'll say a couple of things. There's a big component of my entire existence, which is rooted in faith, right? I've been going to church since before I was a human. Um, and uh, faith and belief in, in God, but also in the belief uh, in justice, right? That justice is not only uh, possible, but it is created in our relationship and community with one another. And it's our faith that has propelled us, particularly uh, people who are descendants of enslaved folks to the point where we now are, where you are Dean, right? Like this is, this is extraordinary. And so I, when I think about my life, uh, the black church gets a lot of credit uh, for helping to shape my uh, understanding uh, of liberation, help shape my understanding of what um, the pursuit of both God uh, and the pursuit of justice means. Uh, sometimes, I, I, one of my pastors said, sometimes we, uh, God's hands are at the ends of our own arms. And really, 
uh, having graduated from college uh, and spent some years doing economic justice and social justice work, uh, uh, I have learned more about how the system is designed this way. It didn't, it didn't just happen this way. And the importance of uh, uh, that being attached to a faith that says there is a different future possible, right? There is a different worldview that we can make manifest in the work that we do. And so I believe faith has played a critical component. Then my family is a central element. My parents had kids, uh, Dean Douglas is teenagers. Uh, my, my oldest brother, my mom was 15 and my dad was 16. And I have three older brothers um, and, and one younger one. And uh, seeing their, the strife, but also the strife, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the sermon they heard in 1995, year I was born, Vision 2000, they decided to go get uh, uh, bachelor's degrees and master's degrees to help us not to live in poverty and perpetuity, right? There's something that happens when you live with people who are determined folk, uh, as my parents are, uh, who recognize that uh, maybe we'll be the first in our families to do certain things. Uh, but if we take these steps, uh, if we make these efforts, then future folks won't have to go through the same struggles, right? It's that, it's that inheritance that has actually been passed forward since those 20 or so slaves came off the, the ships onto these shores and those millions of people came over. There's something that's been passed forward, a, a level of determination, uh, regardless of circumstance, uh, that, that I, I have heard about enough and seen enough that I, my family and parents have embodied that I, I seek to carry forward. And then there's been this education and, and this is really critical. Uh, um, uh, maybe it was T.S. Eliot who says, you know, I never let my schooling get in the way of my education. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the places where I went to learn uh, uh, can't get in the way of what I, was, what, I, what I was meant to learn, right? And so I went to a historically white institution for college. I studied government and education, um, but I'd also got schooling here at this school uh, where I am now, where, where uh, we were denied textbooks. We were denied teachers in certain classrooms. And it just so happens that was 11 years ago. Uh, but the same community is the one where we had to fight a pipeline, right? There's some, there's an education happening here uh, that I didn't miss, uh, fortunately, because I had really good mentors and I had really good people in my corner who said, you really want to be observant to what is going on, uh, but also be active. And, and that is what the faith and the family have called me to, to cause me to do as well, which is to be active. And when I was at college, uh, I was able to study American government and education, and I got the words right. And this is the struggle uh, that sometimes certain people will only listen when you use certain words. That's right. Right. Uh, they, they'll only seek to understand when you show up a certain way due to the white supremacist culture, due to the classism, due to all of the sexism or whatever the case might be. Like that sometimes is the case. And so I learned the codes of power, as Lisa Delpit might call it, uh, to engage uh, uh, with these more difficult topics. And then, you know, I worked in a company and work in a company where I get exposure to corporations and philanthropists and my CEO is an extraordinary mentor that again, I learned some codes of power that we have a responsibility then to use those codes of power that we have and choose a social location with people who don't have them because they've been excluded from them. They've been marginalized. As, as one of my preachers said, Jesus chose a social location of the poor right? You choose a social location of those who've been excluded. And so what I have invested in doing and have been helped and supported with thousands of people with MCAP and our, our coalition is to choose a social location with those who were called the path of least resistance to prove that they really are the path of resilience because see their ancestors made it. Uh, let me say that their ancestors made it, right? I mean, they, they survived uh, the, 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 the American South of cotton fields and, 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 and tobacco fields and, and my folk in South Carolina, the rice, pad, right? They, they, these folks, they survived well, we all of these here, things. Right? We wouldn't be here if, if they, if, it, it wouldn't be happening. And so they passed forward a resilience that has to be recognized and that, uh, that honestly, it has to be honored. And we got to mourn it too, yeah. that people shouldn't have had to go through what they went through. People shouldn't have had to pick bodies off of trees like they had to, right? That didn't have to happen. But the fact that there was an endurance, right? That the fact that they, they did endure those 
travesties in order that we might be here, it means that we have a responsibility and an obligation to the people who would be most marginalized because if we reflected back for centuries, that was us. That's right. Right. And still we are marginalized, still we are suffering, but those of us who have a little more privilege have a responsibility and are accountable to God herself to do something. Yeah. Yeah. No. Oh my goodness. Justin, I want to say, keep preaching, keep teaching. Uh, you said so much and just, you know, this one matter of faith and the, and the notion. And, and, and I, I hope people heard this when you talk about that, you know, God's uh, hands uh, are at the end of uh, our arms. And, and, and what you're suggesting here is that justice isn't, as we like to say here at EDS, isn't the add-on. It is the gospel, right? It's not the extra, it is the gospel. And to be a people of faith is to partner with God, be God's hands, as you put it, in mending the earth. And these people that, uh, that led us here, I, I like this, the path, they are the uh, path to resistance, but they also, the, and as you said, the path to justice. And we're gonna get to justice, we have to start with the people who live on the underside. Of, 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 of that justice and, and the handing down of the stories and, and what you uh, learned uh, in terms of stories uh, and handing down the stories of a people, the, the good and bad, the struggles and the striving, as you put it. So thank you. I just hope, I hope as people listen to this, they go back and listen again because that uh, was a, a testimony and I, and I, and I thank you uh, for that, Justin. Justin, I could talk with you all afternoon, and I hope everyone is seeing why, in fact, you are not simply the hope for our future, but in our present. Uh, uh, and so I want to ask you this, and we'll get out of here on this. If you were to close your eyes, Mr. Justin J. Pearson, and imagine from the middle of the town that is Boxtown, what a just society would look like. What would that be? That's such a good question. It looked like It looked like the black folk who lived there being at peace. Mm. When mm. right now you live with the worry about what's in your air, you know? Live with the worry about whether somebody else is gonna try and dump something in your neighborhood hate your land, you know? Look like people just being at peace. Mm. People being at peace. That's an image. Take us in to the future. Let me tell you this, Mr. Pearson. There are often times that I find myself on the verge of hopelessness and despair. And it is when I meet those rare persons like yourself, those young people, those young voices, young black men with a vision, with a commitment, and with a passion for God's justice, that this old soul finds her hope. You give me hope, Mr. Pearson, and for all of those persons who don't know black boy joy, <laughs> right? You are my black boy joy. 
Thank you, Justin J. Pearson, for joining me in this conversation this afternoon. Thank you for the work you are doing for a more just future. I invite all of you back for our future conversations, our just conversations. I invite you into our book read on the 1619 Project, uh, where we will be engaging in conversation, Dr. Khalil Muhammad, one of the essayists in that project. Please be on the lookout for registration for that. Thank you again, and thank you, Justin Pearson. Okay, we're off. Okay.